All right, thanks for coming out, everyone. Can everyone hear me? OK, great. Uh, I, I asked the media guy to stream reruns of The Office on the side so you guys didn't actually have to pay attention. I think he's working on that now. So, um, But until that gets up, we'll go, we'll go to my presentation, which is coming to terms with hosting. Um, basically, hosting can be super complicated. And if you're a new user, which we've all been at one point in our lives, it can be really, really confusing. Uh, in the industry, there's a lot of terms that people throw around that they, they just throw them around because they've been using them for a long time. But sometimes we forget that not everyone is used to all of those terms. So this is a very beginner level uh, presentation. And it's meant to just go over the basic terms uh, that you'll come across when you're looking at picking a host. So let's get into it. OK, so first, what is web hosting? Very basic. It's, we've got you over here uploading files and content to your host, to a web host, which then associates that with your domain name and presents that in a consumable format to website visitors. Very simple, but that's, that's how your web host plays into this. That's, that's the server, that's the computer that you're uploading your files and your content to so that it can be made available in an easily consumable manner for, uh, for site visitors. So before we go too much into it, uh, I think it's, it's very important to understand your website and what specific needs you are looking for when shopping for a host. So here's, here's a couple things that uh, I would recommend keeping in mind as you're looking into it. And just as a side note, there will be a Q&A at the end of this. However, if you're here and if you're thinking about shopping for a web host, I would highly recommend writing down questions you have for web hosts. There's a bunch of web hosts here. Any of them are wonderful options. So uh, I, I'd be happy to answer the questions that you come up with. But if we don't get to them or if I can't answer them, then don't hesitate to talk to any of the web hosts that are here. So something to think about uh, is, your, is it a pr personal website or is it a professional website? You know, what kind of uptime do you need? What kind of reliability do you need? Are you going to be accepting money? You know, are you going to be selling goods? Are you going to be having financial transactions? Are you going to be storing data? With GDPR coming out, storing data and storing clients' information is a huge buzz topic right now. Uh, what happens if your site goes down? That can be absolutely catastrophic if you're, taking it, if you're taking money, if you rely on your website for your, for your paycheck. Uh, what happens if your site gets hacked? And what happens if your site gets suspended? You know, Google, as well as most of the web hosts out there, are always trying to improve the web. So you know, if someone is especially spammy, then Google or other web monitors or even your web host might shut you down if you're perceived as a spammy thing, as a spammy site. So uh, be aware of what, what you can do to get shut down so that you can avoid it, obviously. And on top of that, if you do get shut down, whose responsibility it is and what tools you have to, to get your site back up. OK, so going on, domains. Domains is obviously a big part, if you remember from that first slide. The domain is your URL. That's your home page. That's, that's your address. So that's, the, that's their personal address for your website. Um, whoever purchases the domains owns the right to that domain. As a quick side note for that, this is if you are building your website from the ground up. So if, if you're planning on doing this all by yourself and you want to buy the domain, you want to install everything, build everything, then this is for you. If you hire a developer and say, hey, I want to go out and get this domain name, if the developer purchases the domain name, they might have the legal rights to your domain name. So they, as I mentioned before, these are just things to keep in mind as you're going through this process. If if you have a million dollar idea that you plan on having for years to come, 
then if you work with a developer, you might want to make sure, like, hey, this is the domain name, and I want you to buy it for me, and I want to make sure that it is in my domain name, because obviously whoever owns the domain name owns the rights to the content on that and has the control of that domain. So um, you obviously don't have to host your domain at the same place that you host your website. You can have it in two separate places. Or so you can have your domain, you can purchase your domain in one location and purchase your web hosting from a different location. Often web hosts will package that together just for the ease of the customer, um, but you are, you are welcome to purchase it at different places. Moving on, so just some textbook definitions, a subdomain, so if you have mydomain.com, a subdomain is the appendage in before the mydomain.com. So you can do like blog.google.com, uh, and that would be a subdomain. You can also have a subdirectory, so mydomain.com forward slash subdirectory. So again, you can do mydomain.com forward slash blog. And that, that's entirely dependent on you, on how you want to structure your site. There are arguments to be made that um, it, in introducing a subdomain can interfere with your SEO, but we're not going to get too deep into that today. Um, but just if you hear subdomain thrown around, this is what they're talking about, that appendage before mydomain.com. DNS records. Uh, DNS records can be very, very confusing for the beginner. Basically, it's a phone book for your website. So within your website, you can have, with, with those subdomains that we were just talking about, you can give them a separate address for every subdomain. So you can have, if someone goes to blog.amazon.com or whatever, you can have that actually load from a different IP address than your actual website. So DNS records are essentially the directory. When someone goes to your website, when they, when they hit that URL, it's the directory that says, where are we loading this content from? Where are we bringing these pieces in from? Um, you, can also, you can also specialize using DNS records. So if you want to have your website in one location and your email in a different location, hosted on a different server, then you would use DNS records to say, okay, my MX records or my mail exchange records, uh, if someone is, for my, for my email processing, I'm going to offload that to a separate location. By the way, if anyone has questions, we will do questions at the end, but if you have a very pressing question for what's going on, feel free to raise your hand and, and I'll do my best to answer it. Okay, so domain terms define IP address versus URL. IP address, this is a list of IP address. This is, this is just basically the, the hex codes that they use to identify a website, that the browsers, um, it's just basically an address. Who here has been to these websites? <laughs> One person has. I guarantee that almost everyone in this room has, because these are the actual websites. These are the URLs that we use. So the IP address on the side, these are, these are all the same websites. And often you can go into your browser and type this code, and it will load that website. Um, but it's, this is, if you were to buy an IP address, it'd be really hard for branding and you know, for people to remember what your website is. So they made it in a very consumable packet so that we can, we can have it in such a way that we can understand it and that we can use a lot easier. So IP addresses on one side, URLs on the other. TLDs. TLD stands for top level domains. Here are some of the original top-level domains. And uh, this picture that I grabbed off Google Images is, I guess, as old as these domains. It didn't have enough pixels to make it today, I guess. But so these are the, the most popular ones. We've got .com, .org, .net, .gov. I'm sure all of you have seen most of those. Um, within the past couple years, they have introduced new TLDs, top-level domains. So now, there's a whole new pile of options that you can choose from. You can get .photography, .pizza, uh, .blog, .club. 
Um, there's there's limitly, limitless options uh, as, uh, as far as what you can get for a TLD. Um, most people still stay with the, the main original .com, .org, .edu. However, it can be fun to use some of the new TLDs, and some of them are, are becoming more and more prevalent to use. You know, if, you, if you're a photographer, then dot photography makes sense. Domain privacy, this is a big one. Um, when you register your domain, as I mentioned, if you are the person that registers the domain, you have to put your information that's associated with that domain. And you can go out and look up any domain out there to see who is the owner of that domain. A lot of people, especially on the internet, don't want all their information out there for privacy re reasons. And so there's domain privacy. And if you have domain privacy, then it masks all of your personal information so that contact information is not readily available. And the, re the reason I'm going over these, these are terms that are associated with domains, but these are also features. I think as you're shopping around for a host, it's important to know what comes with this or what is an added feature that I have to pay for. Uh, also, temporary URLs and domains, usually this is with moving websites. So if you're migrating a website or if you're creating a staging environment, both things which we'll talk a little bit, uh, little bit more about in just a minute, but if you're creating those, sometimes you can come up with a temporary URL so you can see both sites, what they look like, and uh, so that your live site can remain unaffected as you're building a new site or migrating a, an existing site. And this is, this is just a big wall of text that goes over pretty much everything we just covered. Uh, these slides will be available later for you to come back and, and take a look at if you'd like. So let's, let's continue on to hosting plans. Any questions so far? Question in the back? Uh, what do you know about SSL? SSL certificates? Yeah. We will go into that in just a little bit. Is it okay if I wait until that part to answer that? And then if I don't answer your question, just wave your hands, and, and I'll, I want to make sure that we get that answered. So hosting plans, there's a lot of different options out there. These are the main ones that you'll see with most of the popular hosts. You've got shared hosting, VPS, cloud, dedicated, a dedicated server, and then managed hosting. Uh, and then there's also local versus web hosting. Uh, I'm actually going to go kind of in reverse order on explaining these. Local hosting is if you are building your website on your laptop or, or on your machine at home. So um, it's not, so uh, if you're building a, a website on the web, then you're building it essentially on the server, so that means that it's accessible to anyone that can access that server, which is, you know, if you have a good host, pretty much anyone in the world. If, if you're building a site locally on your desktop, then it's not accessible to everyone. So people will use that for a staging environment, for a development environment, so that they can build out their website just on their own computer. They don't have, you don't have to have an internet connection to do that. Um, but that's becoming an increasingly popular feature to have the option to build your website without an internet connection. And then when you're ready, you can migrate it onto the web so that people can view it. Um, managed hosting, what does it actually mean? It's, it's a little bit ambiguous, and I think everyone has a different definition. Um, the definition that Bluehost in particular uses is that we manage your updates for your WordPress installation. We make sure that you're on the most current version of WordPress, and we also make sure that your themes and plugins are up to date. And we also manage all of the back-end hardware and the server side of things. But each, each host will t traditionally have a different definition on what managed hosting means to them. So I've got, I've got a couple different diagrams to, to try to simplify this a little bit. With shared hosting, we've got one server with multiple websites. With VPS and dedicated, we have one server that, or one partition that has a single website. And with cloud hosting, you can dynamically expand it, so you can have one or multiple servers that, that serve up one website. Uh, 
I'm a fairly simple guy, so I like to simplify it even more with something that I understand and use every day. Shared hosting is like apartment living, okay? So you're, you're sharing resources with your neighbors. You're sharing the same building. You might even have like a, a shared laundry area that everyone goes to. And so you, you have your own space, and theoretically, your neighbors shouldn't really affect you. But anyone that's lived in an apartment knows that occasionally, you know, you'll get noisy neighbors, or someone with a, will have a, someone will have a, a neighbor that has an apartment that floods, and that some, can sometimes trickle into your apartment. So it's usually a, a very price economic option, but it can also come with other uh, issues. Uh, such as noisy neighbors, which in a hosting, in hosting language, that might equal um, people being throttled or, or people's activities affecting your website as well. So shared hosting is our apartment. On the complete opposite side of uh, the spectrum is a dedicated server. That's essentially a pile of lumber. You get to build with it whatever you want. So for everyone that's sitting here with us today, probably not what you want to go for um, because you have to build it however you want. So you get to and you have to. So you can, you can build whatever you're capable of, but for me, if I'm looking at my development skills, I'm taking a couple two by fours and I'm wrapping them with duct tape and I'm trying to build a teepee. And that's, that's, not, the great, that's not the best framework for a house or for a website. So for the advanced user, this is great because it gives them access to the server side where they can implement the different tools and the different products that they want to incorporate in their website. Uh, but for the novice user, it's, it can be really overwhelming. Kind of a, a happy medium between the two is a, a VPS, which stands for Virtual Private Server. This is, this is like a, the best of both worlds where you're sharing the same hardware but you have a more dedicated space to you. It's, it's partitioned to you, so you're, you're, you're not sharing the same washer and dryer as your neighbor, essentially. You have more dedicated resources for your activities, for your website, um, but it still is relatively cost efficient. And then cloud is kind of like Airbnb, where it's dynamically expandable. So, if you want to spin it up so that you have more CPU or so that you can handle more traffic, you can do that very quickly. So I'm kind of going back and forth between the, the analogy here, but uh, sticking with the analogy, if you want to have 30 guests, you can go on Airbnb and you know, get a couple, couple different houses really easily to accommodate your guests. But if they're only there for two nights and then for the rest of the week, you know, it's only you and a couple friends, then you can, you can adjust that and have that customized to fit your exact schedule and your exact needs in the time. Um, usually upon sign up, so, so the question was, how do I know what my hosting, is com my hosting company is using for my website? Let me answer his question real quick and then I'll get to you. So usually upon sign up, uh, you, they ask you to select a plan, and usually they'll, they'll present you with a couple different plans. Uh, and when you select that plan, that's when you would select either shared or VPS or cloud or dedicated. Um, if they send you a confirmation email with your purchase, it should be in there somewhere, like, okay, you are on this plan. Um, also, if you go into your account for your host, then it, it should say what plan you're on currently and give you the option to upgrade or, or downgrade. Does, does that answer your question? Okay, what was your question, sir? There's actually a website called whoishostingthis.com, so if you actually, and I've done this where I've taken over websites and even they don't know what plan they're on right away, and while they're digging, I go to who is hosting this, put the URL in, and it says, okay, it's Bluehost, or it's GoDay, or it's Pantheon, or it's InMotion, or whoever. And it just saves a lot of time. And I just, you know, at least I know at least who they're hosted by. And I can figure at that point what the plan is. Yeah, so, so for anyone that didn't hear that, he was saying you can go to whoishostingthis.com, and that can tell you who the, the company is that's hosting the website. Yeah, to my knowledge, that doesn't give you what plan they're on, but that gives you a great start into knowing what company you're being hosted with. Or as, right, yeah. 
And if, if you're a developer, then it gives you a lot of information um, on the website that you're working with. Okay, so hosting features. Space and size, what is unlimited versus unmetered? You'll see a lot of hosting companies talk about, we offer unlimited space or unlimited storage. I'm no math major, but the universe is finite, and so there's no way they can possibly offer unlimited storage, right? So, this is, so if it's not actually unlimited storage, what is it? Oftentimes, it's a, it's a, it's a way that they separate the plan. So some companies might say, or, or some hosting plans might say, we offer five gigs of storage, okay? Um, and others might say, we offer unlimited storage. They might not actually offer unlimited storage, but they don't limit you to that five gigs. They don't, they don't set a cap on it. Going to a simplified example, moving truck. We got up here. This guy's packed down pretty, pretty nice and neat. Um, we'll say, if you're putting a cap on the storage, it's like saying, okay, you can, you can pack your boxes to the level of the truck bed or, or you know, to the top of the cab. And, and that's where we cap you off. We're not gonna let you roll out of here renting our moving truck if you pack anything above the cab of the truck. And there you got unlimited. So you can do it. There's not a roof on, on top of the pickup bed. We'll let you roll out. Uh, as long as it's on there, you can go with it. As I'm sure you guys can guess, one of these two trucks is gonna be a little bit better to take down a highway, right? So sometimes you will see with the, with the unlimited, you can put whatever you want and you can build it as high as you're capable of, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you won't run into performance issues or other issues that go along with stretching that out. And also unmetered is another, another thing. So Unmetered is just basically saying, we're not, we're not, we don't care about that. We're not gonna keep an eye on that. So, for example, visitors. Some, some companies will say, we allow you uh, 25,000 visitors a month. And others will say, you know, you can have unmetered visitors, which is, we just, we don't, we're not keeping an eye on that metric. So it's, it's completely unmetered. Any questions on that? Because that, be, that can be really confusing sometimes. I don't know if I just did such an amazing job explaining it or if you guys are being quiet. I'm gonna assume I'm amazing, unless, unless proven otherwise, which is pretty easy to do. Okay, moving on. Hosting features, traffic limits. So with limits, I wanna talk about what different limits they can implement. So bandwidth, so that's data as a resource, kind of like with your cell phone, you know, with Verizon, I've, I've got like three gigs a month that I can use, and then once I hit that limit, they will either throttle my usage on my cell phone, or they will charge me extra to continue using uh, above my plan, above my plan. Web hosts often act the same way. They'll give you a certain bandwidth restriction, and if you get close to it or above it, they'll start throttling the usage or charge you extra. Uh, you can also be limited on your monthly transfer limit. You know, you can only transfer five gigs of data a month, uh, or even just a, a single time transfer limit, a data transfer limit, meaning you can only transfer 500 megabytes at, at a single transfer. Uh, occasionally, you'll also see companies that limit by unique visitors or, or page visits and say, as I mentioned previously, you can have 25,000 visitors a month, and if you start exceeding that, then we recommend you go up to our bigger plan. Okay, hosting features. We're gonna go through these kind of quick. This is, excuse me, this is <clears throat> just a, a bunch of features that some hosts have, other hosts don't. Some hosts offer for free, others charge for them. As I mentioned in the very beginning, it's most important that you understand your site and your needs uh, so that when you're going out and talking with a host and, and trying to figure out which company you should go with, uh, you understand your needs and what you're looking for. So emails. Uh, some hosts will limit how many email addresses you can have on your account or the size of a specific 
email address. You know, so if you have a company with 10,000 employees, some hosts might say, you, we're, we're actually going to limit you to 500 email addresses, so you're not going to be able to have an email address for every single one of your employees. Or on the flip side of that, if you're the sole proprietor and you have all of your emails coming to you and you run a photography website, they might limit it and say, hey, you can, you can only have 50 gigs of data on that email address. And each host is different. Uh, I just want to make you guys aware of some of the different restrictions that you can see out there so that, as I mentioned, you can tailor it to what you need and what your fit is. Migration. This is a pretty hot topic right now. Migrating your website. Uh, if you're buying a website, uh, an existing website, you know, if you're taking over a company, then you might want to migrate it to a host that you're more familiar with or that you already have an existing account with. Um, also, uh, if, you're, if you have some site that you don't want to give up and you're ready to go to a new host, it's, it's always important to know what migration options you have. Some hosts will do it for free, some offer it as a charged service, but it's, it's important to know what exactly you're getting. Ease of installation. So installing WordPress and other things, how easy is it? You can find hosting companies out there where they just give you a terminal login and you have to take it from there. For, for me and for a lot of novice users, that's going to be really, really complicated. A lot of the hosts nowadays have implemented a one-click install for WordPress or, uh, or an install um, during the registration flow, which is even easier in my opinion, so that by the time you're actually into your hosting account, you already have WordPress installed and ready to go. Staging environment, staging or sandbox or development environment. This is kind of going back to what we were talking about a little bit with the, the local host. Staging basically allows you to take a test site, uh, or a carbon copy of the test site, and have that copy so that you can change that. You can change the themes, you can change the content, you can change whatever you'd like, and then you can either migrate the files to the live site, or the content to the live site, or, or all of the above, or the database to the live site. Uh, it just essentially gives you a developmental tool so that you can try whatever you want, or try a new plugin or a new theme. As I mentioned before, some, some hosts offer that for free, some offer it as a charged feature. Uh, if you think that you need it, then it's just something to be aware of. Caching. This is, this is a new, another very hot topic. Caching is essentially um, implementing different tools to optimize the load speed of your website. So there's a bunch of different caching tools out there, and there's a bunch of different ways to do caching. We won't get too deep into that today. I just want you guys to be familiar with the term caching. It's, it's essentially compressing or, or, I mean, it depends on the caching tool that you're using, but it optimizes the load speed of your website. Some, some companies have a custom caching tool. As I mentioned before, some it's a free feature, some it's a paid feature. Uh, others, there, there's, if you're using WordPress, there's a handful of different caching plugins out there that you should definitely be utilizing. FTP access, what's your, what's your file transfer access or what's your access to your files? FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol. FileZilla is the most popular one that I am aware of. It just basically allows you to upload and download files from your computer to your server. And the SFTP is just introducing um, encryption. So if we don't get too much into site security, but um, if you want to ensure security, then you can do your file transfers over a secured port and over a secured transfer, and that just makes it so that hackers or malicious users out there don't try to intercept your data or intercept your files. For most people, you know, if you're doing like a cat blog, who cares if someone intercepts your, your transfers, but if you are doing customer information, if you're doing any medical stuff, 
uh, if you're doing any payment processing, then that's a really big deal if someone is interfering or intercepting your data. So um, SFTP allows you to uh, use an encryption to securely upload com information from your computer to your server, to your website. Also, scalability. I used Amazon as an example. Um, back in the day, they were just a little bookstore. They are no longer just a little bookstore. You know, they are huge, obviously. And so they expanded very quickly. Uh, I hope that we're all as successful as Amazon. Fingers crossed. I don't think the numbers necessarily play in our favor. But if you are going to be expanding your website, then it's good to know what your expansion options are, what kind of scalability your host offers. How easy is it to upgrade your plan, to add more uh, CPU, to add more RAM to your existing plan? Easy to use dashboard. As I mentioned before, there are some companies out there that just basically give you shell access, which is just basically a, a terminal, just a line of code, and you have to code everything and, and do everything that way. That's not an easy to use dashboard, in my opinion. That's not even a dashboard, if you ask me. Uh, there's also cPanel out there, which is a step in the right direction. And some hosts use their own custom version of a cPanel. But if, if you're a novice, then it's worth taking a minute or two to see how easy their dashboard is to use. There's a million different tools out there, even in the WordPress space, that you can use to build your website and to make it work how you want it to. And it's important in my mind that you know what your options are and what your resources are. And sometimes in an effort to give you as many resources as they possibly can, I think control panels can sometimes get confusing and overwhelming. So make sure that the dashboard that you're going to be using is easy to use. Uh, backups, that's a big one. You should always be responsible for your own backups. I highly recommend uh, downloading a backup completely independent of your web host. However, some, a lot of web hosts will have like a daily and a monthly backup and a weekly backup as well uh, that they keep on their servers. However, I cannot stress enough, you should always take responsibility and have a, have a private copy of your website somewhere on your, your files. Um, as I mentioned before with these hosting features, I mostly want to shed light on them so that you know what, what, you, what you might be looking for and if you need it for your website that you can understand what exactly it is. Auto updates, some hosts will do it, others will not. Basically it's just keeping all of your your plugins and your themes and your WordPress install up to date. SSL certificates, as you mentioned before. Uh, SSL certificates is basically encrypting the data that is transmitted through your website. So if you're processing credit cards, you need an SSL certificate. Google actually came out not that long ago and said they're going to start penalizing sites without an SSL certificate. Um, so. I would highly recommend getting an SSL certificate for your website. A lot of hosts are offering SSL certificates for free now. Uh, others, it's a paid option. If you are transacting credit cards or any sort of sensitive information or data, definitely make this a high priority to see what options you have available and what you get with your host. PHP version and software version. Just like WordPress and all the apps on our phone, PHP is constantly being developed and evolving and coming out with a newer and a better version. Uh, for, I think PHP 7.2, I think, is the version that they're currently on. Um, so just make sure that the host that you're, that you're looking into is using a, a current version of PHP and a current version of their software and that it, it plays nicely with everything that you'll be using. Hosting helplines. We've all been in this situation before. We all hope that we never have to be there, but that's just a sad reality is, you know, we've all called tech support for something or other. Maybe not even with, with uh, web hosting, but we've all called it before. So as you're looking at, as you're looking at evaluating different hosts, 
uh, be aware of what, how accessible their help is to you, what's their tech support, um, are they open 24-7, are they only emails or only online chat, or can you call and talk to a person, and also make sure that they're acceptable. You know, as, you're, as we're going through this, you will probably need a lifeline at some point, so make sure that you understand exactly what your web host is providing and what what they're taking responsibility for and what they are saying is your responsibility. Paid extras, we'll go through these even more quickly. Security, as I mentioned before. Um, security is often the user's responsibility. There's a lot of companies out there that offer security. It's usually a paid extra, but uh, some, some hosts will give like a, a light version or like a freemium version of a security plugin, so that's just something to be aware of. Design, some companies will give design resources or you know, have, have something where you can call in and speak to a designer, so that's, that's always helpful. Storage, as I mentioned, backups, we've already talked about that. Uh, we've talked about emails, um, let's see, oh, sign up versus renewal rate, this is something I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention. Oftentimes, hosts will give you an introductory rate that is different from the renewal rate. So when you're, start, when you're evaluating price, be sure to factor that in, and also the term length. You know, just like, just like buying a car or a house, usually the, the longer the term, the lower the price is. But just be aware of, of what that translates to in the end. Um, and that's my last slide, but I did want to finish by saying if this, this can be very, very overwhelming for a beginner user. So if it is overwhelming, that's why we're all here at WordCamp, is to help each other be successful with WordPress. More than likely, you can give your neighbor some ad advice, or if, if not, they can usually give you some advice. So don't be, don't be bashful to find resources right here. Also, if that's too overwhelming, there's also ton, there's a ton of web development shops where they will take care of everything on the hosting end. Um, and just as a closing thought, there, there's a bunch of hosts that are here sponsoring. I would highly recommend taking your questions and talking to any of them. They would be more than happy to, to answer any questions that we don't get to today. And on that note, time for questions or are we done? No, we've got a couple questions, but thank you, Devin. Good, good job. Yeah. Thank you. There we go. Just time for a couple of questions. Here we go. Hey, Devin, great presentation. Thank you, Christina. Um, sometimes my clients ask me, do they need a unique IP or not? So when they're getting hosting, should they pay for the unique IP? What would you say to that? Do they need a unique IP or not? Um, I would say it depends on what they're trying to do with their website. Uh, traditionally, if you get an SSL certificate, you need an, uh, a dedicated IP, which is what we're, we're talking about. Um, it's, it's not necessarily the case. So I, I would say it depends, it depends exactly on what they're trying to do as a short answer, which is not a great answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> it depends on the website is what it comes down to. But, but I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards on the specific example if you'd like. More Here you go. What should most beginning websites be considering in terms of uh, cost overrun potentials? Like when you're thinking about those, the, the, you know, the analogy with the truck, what are some of the factors we should be thinking about? How do we go about like kind of estimating and predicting what we might need? And is, and on, on, are these introductory packages that most hosting providers offer, do they have kind of a hidden danger that you know if we get attacked or we have a security breach or we have something some unexpected traffic that we're going to get a huge bill that you know is in addition to what we're paying that's a great question um, one that we hear a lot is you know which which plan is right for me and if I go with a beginner plan am I, am I kind of opening myself up to attack or, or a, a hidden bill on the backside um, honestly that is one of the reasons that w we wanted to talk about this today was so that that's something that you can go and approach a company with, because I think it depends, depending on, or it changes depending on the company. Um, personally, I would say if you're just beginning, if you're getting a new site off the ground, 
most of the beginning packages are built for that. Um, it, so it depends, it depends on, on uh, the nature of your website. So if, I'll give an example, if you're a wedding photographer, then you, you, you want to make sure that the package that you purchase allows for the space of high definition images. Um, but most hosts that I'm aware of, if you go with their beginner plan, that's a great beginning spot. They allow you to upgrade and progress as you move along. Um, as far as overrunning your limits, what the consequences are for that, it, I think it depends, yeah, I think it varies depending on the host. So some will either throttle you and, and slow down your site, which, is, which can be super frustrating, or others will charge you for exceeding uh, your usage, which is sometimes more frustrating. I think, I think they're both equally frustrating. Um, so, but, but that's why I talked about a, a lot of the things that we did today so that you're, you're aware when you're going and talking to the host saying, hey, um, this is the website I'm thinking about building. Uh, my concern is that I might exceed your storage limits. What are the consequences if that happens to me? And I know that pretty much every host out there would be happy to answer that question. One last question. Hosting feature page, so I can get a screenshot of that. Hosting feature page. Are you going to post these slides? Yes, I will post these slides. Um, is it this one? <laughs> this one. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm already hosting locally, and I use MAMP Pro to mess around with this little server. Uh, when I do the file transfer protocol to you, do you just need the photo or the folder of WP for that site? So when I save it, it has a WP. I got sites and I made multiple page or websites. So when I do the hosting with you, what do you guys need to have all those if I want to add them? Yeah, so, so to make sure that I understand your question, it's when you're uploading content, whether it be pictures or something like that. I just want to take it active. I already have the website built on Demand Pro. I have the WordPress. But I don't want it to be local. I want to have multiple websites. Right. So if you've developed it local, depending on what you use to develop it locally, uh, some will give you the option to migrate it to live, essentially. If not, then when you do purchase a hosting plan, Usually you can, in, you, you basically treat it like a migration, like you're migrating it from your local machine to the server. And you can find a lot of documentation about migrating a website. I'd be happy to talk to you after this in more detail about it. Um, but basically you're just trying to get the files and the database onto the server. Yeah. All right, big round of applause for Devin.